بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد uh, My apologies first because I can't see any of you This light is uh, too much I can't see you so unfortunately I'll have to just imagine that you're all sitting there Inshallah <laughs> Uh, the first thing I want to mention is that this is my, you can say, my first, uh, 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 my first visit to uh, Holland, uh, the Netherlands, uh, the land of the Dutch, uh, whatever you want to call it. And initially, for the last uh, several years, the idea that I, I, can't, I can only speak for myself and maybe a few others, uh, the idea we had of this country... Um, oh, mashallah, I can actually start seeing some of you now. Um, the idea we had of this country was a representation of this Khit Wilders. He defines who Netherlands is for the people outside. So we thought it's a really racist place and I really felt sorry for the Muslims. All of you brothers and sisters that are here, I felt really sorry for you all this time. I traveled to many other countries but never to this country. However, mashallah, it's been a pleasant surprise. Uh, after coming here, flying into Amsterdam, doing a little tour of Amsterdam. Uh, by the way, the tour of Amsterdam meant the big masajid, not anything else. <laughs> and I was completely and utterly surprised by the size of the masjids that you have. For example, the Hagia Sophia Mosque, the brand new mosque that's uh, recently built. You know, when around Europe, I've traveled a number of countries, both around Europe, I've lived in America and other places, and the sheer size and the prominence, the imposing nature of your masajid, it's really something that you must be thankful about. Because this is a, a really important symbol. I'll give you an idea. Switzerland, a place like Switzerland, which is supposed to be where Geneva, where the UN is, it's supposed to be such an international kind of city. I know you have the, 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 uh, the Den Haag or whatever you call it here, the, the Hague. But still, Geneva is uh, you know, one of the more prominent cities in that regard. Still, they have an issue with minarets. It's just too much of a symbol of Islam. Um, Moscow, I have some friends in Moscow. There's about two million Muslims apparently in Moscow, but only about three or four masjids apparently. Uh, you go to France, which has so many Muslims, and they have to pray in basements, and, and you know, they're, they're, subhanAllah, I was really pleasantly surprised, you know, even after coming to Rotterdam, and uh, seeing the big minarets, you know, the Ottoman minarets in Europe, that was quite surprising for me. So look, we, after speaking to a number of brothers, uh, it does seem that, mashallah, you do have a lot of rights here as Muslims, and Muslims are comfortable, Muslims, mashallah, are allowed to practice their faith, Look, we have challenges. We have challenges everywhere. England, this is, that's where I'm from. We have challenges there. Uh, I've, I've lived in Muslim countries. We have challenges there in Muslim countries. I don't think there's a single country in the world where people don't have challenges. Challenges is the nature of this world, this dunya. As long as we're in this dunya, there's going to be challenges. Hopefully in the hereafter, if it's Jannatul Firdaus, that's when it will be a life without challenges. The way to deal with this world is to try to deal with the challenges in a successful way. So that inshallah no challenges continue. All our challenges are done in this world. We're free of challenges. Then inshallah we get accepted. Salamun alaikum in Jannatul Firdaus. Inshallah by the angels. Now, one of the, uh, I, I want to speak about a number of different things in the very short time that I have. So the first thing I want to speak about is the challenge of living in a Western paradigm, not just the Western paradigm, but a time of great liberalism, which becomes the dominating ideology. If you look around you, you have many ideas around you, and ideas can be discussed openly. Nobody should have a problem with ideas being discussed. For example, an idea is the idea of justice idea of macroeconomics, economics, marriage, gender rights, these are generally considered ideas and people can talk about them, play about with them, uh, disagree with aspects about them. These things are absolutely possible. However, you then have another, another thing which is called an ideology. An ideology. An ideology is something very different. When you challenge somebody's ideology, 
that is not as easy as challenging an idea, a generic idea. I want you to stay with me. I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible, inshallah. Because this is something that I, you know, I'm, I'm interested in. Ideology is different. What is ideology? Ideology is about the background of your brain. The way you see the world. The way, the lens by which you see the world, even without realizing how you see the world. It is very inherent within us. It's very essential. It's so close to us that we can't even see it. We don't even realize many aspects. It's very deep-rooted. That's an ideology. The only time that you become aware of your ideology is generally when you're made aware of your ideology. For example, there were some tests done on people. A section of people were taken and they were asked that, are you racist? And they all said, clearly we're not racists. We have, we have absolutely nothing to do with racism. We don't agree with any kind of discrimination and racism. However, when they were actually put under certain test conditions, they realized that the inherent racism that they had within them, there were very few people without any kind of racism. I mean, think about it. If you're a, a Moroccan, you will have some ideas about people from Somalia. If you're Somalian, you may have ideas about people from Morocco, from India or Pakistan for that matter. Sometimes these words come out. Sometimes these thoughts come in the mind. We don't realize that we're being racist without realizing it. So an ideology is something very deep rooted. So basically, you may believe in something without even realizing that you believe in that thing or that's the way you think. Among all of the places in any country, it's generally universities, which will be the place that will have the most liberalism, the place of liberalism in any culture. So generally the ideology in any university is generally liberalism. Now, when we say university, I could also say many workplaces. If you are working with many people of other religions in a Western uh, uh, capital or a Western country, the, this is what you're going to come to face, uh, face to face with. As Muslims, generally speaking, we're not gonna, we are not going to share a lot of that ideology. Right? This is where the tension comes. You, we find it so difficult to try to make people realize why we believe in certain things that we believe in. Why a woman has to be covered. Right? Why we have to just drop everything and pray five times a day. It's an ideology issue. The, the best way, basically, if you don't understand that this is the basis of the conflict, then it's going to be very difficult to deal with this conflict. We're constantly on the defensive, putting out fires. We can never objectively explain ourselves. We are constantly having to answer for things that people bring up in the media. And then we have to say, no, it's like this or like that. Some people get it right in their answers, while others get it wrong. The way to deal with this, strangely enough, is to actually discuss these things with people, to openly discuss these people, to overtly discuss these things, bring them up, even if they don't want to discuss it. This is what's going to make a healthier society. Questions that people don't even consider to be questions because it is just so, so settled in their mind that this is the way the world has to be. This is the idea we're speaking about. This is important. Universities generally are supposed to be the best places for these things because it's a place where ideas are discussed. Ideologies should be discussed as well. And this works out to be very good for people. You know, you see the people who uh, become Muslim, reverts. The reason is that somebody has challenged their ideology. They've started thinking of the world differently. So many m new Muslims you will meet who will say, this is what we felt about Islam before. I could never see myself as a Muslim. Then what happened? What changed? Somebody challenged their fundamental ideas and managed to let them see it in a more objective fashion. Basically, what is liberalism? Liberalism, which is pretty much the dominant idea of the West, and it's a global idea right now, is the idea that humans should not be constrained and limited in any way whatsoever by anything, not by religion, nor by tradition. So if you tell them, this is my tradition, this is my culture, this is my religion, people just think that is just so old-fashioned. 
This is the first response. They just think it's old fashioned. Why do you, how can you still believe in this? Have you heard, they say a man from 1400 years ago, you still believe in a religion that came down 1400 years ago. How is that possible? The world has moved on. This is the idea of liberalism. The only thing they say that can constrain us in our laws or public life or uh, inform our morality, etc., is reason. Rational argument only, not tradition or religion, only reason. Sometimes they prove this, you know, sometimes they use uh, rational arguments, empirical arguments. Nobody should judge anything except through reason, through human reason alone only. Now, let's take a simple example of this. One of the manifestations of this, one of the examples of this, very amateur way of looking at it, is there's an idea out there which is very much ingrained in liberalism is that you can do anything as long as you do not harm others. Have you heard that? You're allowed to do anything as long as you don't harm anybody else. Now, this is something we're all aware of, right? This is a general kind of idea. If you do something in the privacy of your bedroom, that's fine. If you do something outside that is going to harm somebody else, it's an issue. That's why you get so many people who will say, you know, I don't believe this, that and the other. As long as you're a good person, as long as you don't think evil of anybody else, as long as you let people live and do what they want, this is the way of harmony in this world. Sounds like a, you know, a great idea in that sense. However, let's look at it from a rational perspective. If you take this idea that you are free to do as you want, you are free or you have the right to do as you want, as long as you do not hurt or harm anyone. Now this seems to be a very simple statement and most people will just accept it. Most people will just accept it. However, let's look at this carefully. This statement is so full of number of assumptions, number of assumptions which many people think that they are, that there's no other way about it. For example, take the first word. You have uh, the last word in here which is as long as you don't harm or hurt anybody. What does harming or hurting mean? How much hurt are you speaking about? Who is going to be hurt? Whose hurt are you speaking about? Is that something that is agreed upon? Or is that something that is open to interpretation? For example, you have the right to do whatever you want as long as it doesn't harm anybody or hurt anybody. If Muslim hearts are hurt by depictions of the Prophet Muhammad then should that still be a right or not? The next point. What is a right? Okay, so let's understand a right as being a human right. A human right is basically all those rights that a human should have because they are human beings. Every one of us. Who decides that? Let's look to the UN. So, many, many decades ago, there's the, the, the human rights um, charter uh, of the UN. And within that, number 19, I think, it says you have the freedom to express whatever you want. Express your religion, express your ideology, express what you believe, what you love, whatever you want to do. This is a fundamental human right that they should be able to express what they want. Right? Now, there's another article, number 29, which says that these rights can be limited or curbed or restricted for the purpose of morality or of public order, for example, or public safety. So now, we understand that the rights that you're supposed to have of saying whatever you want, sh that suddenly becomes restricted. Now, who's going to restrict it? Each country and its laws can restrict these rights. So now, for example, who makes these decisions as to what the dominant ideology should be of the time? Is it going to be certain countries? Or is it going to be an overall uh, group of people or whoever it is, who is it going to be? I'll give you an example. France doesn't allow the veil, right? There's been massive issues there about the veil. However, it does allow nudity on the beaches, right? Okay, that's fine. There's a freedom of right there that they say, but this one, no, because of whatever reason. Now let's go to America. In America, if you've got a man and he wants to go jogging, he is allowed to go jogging and take his top off. So he is allowed to go jogging topless. It's not against the law. However, if a woman wants to do that in America, not in France, but in America, is it allowed? 
In the majority of states, probably all over America, that is not allowed. They will, they will, she will be reported, the police will come. So, in a country like America, where it is allowed to wear the veil, it is allowed for a man to be topless, but not for a woman to be topless. You go to France, and it's the other way around. These decisions are being made by the individual countries. So, what is really human rights then? Who decides what the human right is? At the end of the day, it's the ones who are in power, who have the most influence, who have the media on their side, the greatest propaganda machines, etc. They will decide. And everybody will have to agree to that or be considered to be backwards or whatever the case is. So for example, let's take another example of Egypt. Egypt, for anybody who's been there recently in the last 15 years, right? Because I know in 1950s it was different. But in the last 5, 10, 15 years, about 85% of the women there wear the hijab, the head covering, the, the hijab, right? We're not discussing the niqab yet, we're discussing the, the head covering. About how many people, how many women wear hijab there? About 85%. Are you, uh, are you guys following? 85%. How many, do not, how many do not observe the hijab, that means? 15%. Now, is that an overwhelming majority or not? Now, I'm not saying this, but imagine that they decided that in, front, uh, yeah, sorry, in Egypt, because 85% of the women wear hijab anyway, let's make a law mandating hijab for everybody, for every woman. Do you think that's going to go down well in the international community? Will that be considered to be fine with human rights or will that be considered to be against human rights? Yes. Right. Now, in America, isn't it against human... And again, I'm not vouching for this. I'm not, propo uh, I'm not proposing this, but isn't there a gender discrimination there in that sense? But people have just accepted it. They haven't thought about it too much. They've accepted it. So, whoever has the power the prevailing influence, they're going to determine these things. That is why, because things do not conform to a Western culture and ideology, Egypt would not be, it would have a very hard time in mandating something like this. As an example, it's a hypothesis. Questioning an ideology though, living in the West, in universities, with our colleagues, people we see, our neighbors, etc., and a friendly discussion, you know, over maybe some baklava or whatever the case is, right? Or biryani if that's what you do, right? Questioning that ideology in a nice friendly sense, this is what we're going to have to do to survive. And that is the way we're going to be able to contribute to a better society. And questioning such deep-rooted and blind assumptions are going to sound very ridiculous and absurd to many people. Like, you're questioning that idea? I've never thought about this. It's something that I was born with, something I've been believing all my life. You know, these are things. For example, there was a, uh, a reporter that came to our masjid, our place of prayer in America when I was an imam there. And he, ha he obviously sat on the men's side. Afterwards, he wrote a really nice article. Now, any reporter that comes, they're going to go, you know, in one direction or the other. Mashallah. He really understood, he said, this is, I found myself sitting for the first time since I was a very young boy in an all-male gathering. And it's, it, it was so unusual, it seemed so strange. But then this is what he said. He said, I guess that's just our perspective because we are now so used to even teenage pregnancies, we see no problems with them. So he sees where he's coming from and he's able to enlighten himself that this is a different way of doing things, right? This is what's important to challenge people on an intellectual basis. What's their thoughts? Why do they believe that? Can you not appreciate that somebody else believes something different? And for the health of a, any Western society, this is going to have to happen. Why is it going to have to happen? Because if you, I was in Oslo recently, one in ten people in Oslo is a Muslim. I came back to London and I started thinking after reading that statistic. In London, one out of every eight people is Muslim. Rotterdam, I'm sure it's more than that in terms of how many people are Muslim. In terms of the percentage of Muslims in this country, in this city, in this town, or whatever you want to call it. 
And for us to be able to get along with each other in a respectable way. We're not trying to shove Islam down people's throats. We just want that we be respected for our ideology as well, while being contributing citizens. Citizens that contribute, not just consume. I know we've had problems. I don't know if it's this country or another country where people were very open-minded about immigrants coming in. But certain people among our immigrants came in and started to milk the system, abuse the system. Mashallah, free money, you know, free welfare system. So let's do some work, but also claim, claim, claim. And thus people began to be angry to say, why are these foreigners coming and taking our work away, taking our money away for free? They're driving now Mercedes, right? They get really angry about these things. So when, when people have uh, issues and they see other people cheating the system, it gives a bad name. That's why Muslims are gonna, we're not saying we just want our rights and we don't contribute. We have to contribute. We can't be passive individuals just consuming, consuming, consuming. We have to contribute. And that's, what, that's what's going to be different. So, for example, if you are working somewhere and you want time off for Jumu'ah, and, or for any normal prayer, Dhuhr prayer, for example, and you go and say, this is my right as a Muslim, whatever, you know, I need to be able to pray. But you go late for work. You leave five, ten minutes before. You don't do your projects properly. You don't do your work properly. You, do, you, you, know, you uh, discount here and there. Are you going to get any respect? Is there going to be any respect for us? There's going to be no respect for us. If you are a contributor, a person of value, a true Muhammadi, a true person of integrity, then people are going to respect what you have. I'll give you a simple example. I had a friend who worked in an engineering form, uh, firm. He was, a, uh, he was an engineer for superconductor technologies. This was right in the, 90, uh, in the early 2000s when you know, the, the, the mobile phones, the cell phones had just come out and they needed the superconductor technology. He, mashallah, was a very good engineer, very humble man, uh, half Egyptian, half Palestinian. And he's working in America in this firm. He would refuse to go. He would refuse to go to the annual general meetings because they would serve wine in the annual general meetings. But he was an asset to the company. After about two, three years, he says his supervisor came to him and said to him, uh, we'd like you to come to the annual general meeting this year. It's in, you know, a few weeks or whatever. He said, uh, you know, he mentioned his name. He said, Paul or whatever. You know, I can't come because as you know, I've got an issue. I can't sit, uh, you know, with, uh, with wine being served. And you know what his supervisor tells him? His supervisor tells him that, you know, we've changed the policy this, from this year. We're no, longer to, we're no longer going to serve wine anymore in our annual general meetings. Now, if you think to yourself that, how can I do something? I know we're not hoping for miracles like this all the time, but what I'm trying to say is that if you are an asset and you're a Muslim at the same time, then you will be able to, in people's minds, link success to Islam, not failure to Islam, which the media is putting through, which basically, unfortunately, many of our people uh, seem to be contributing towards as well around the world, a failure story. Unfortunately, that's what's going on. I want to provide some optimism here. That the idea is that if you are in a good position in, in countries like Holland and England and Norway and America and other places where you have rights, where you can work in different fields, well-educated, Muslims are generally well-educated, right? Uh, at least a second generation, mashallah, right? Uh, I, I was just speaking to a brother, his father's a taxi driver, but he himself is a dentist, his brother's a doctor, uh, his, his sister's a pediatrician, I think his other sister's a doctor as well. I mean, this means that we're going we're gonna to have some huge assets, Right? We're going to have some huge assets, but that comes with responsibility. Are those huge assets, all this learning, all this education, is it going to just live the Western dream as such of, uh, of, uh, of this liberalism that do as you wish, do as you want, forget your deen, your tradition, and so on and so forth? Or are you going to hold fast onto your deen and, and contribute? That's the difficulty. That's the difficulty. So what we have to do is we have to challenge assumptions in friendly discussions. Give you another example. One of the biggest things that we're dealing with today is that Muslims are violent people. So there's concepts of Muslim violence, Islamic violence, and so on and so forth. I guarantee you every one of us is beaten with this stick all the time, right? In fact, so many Muslims have actually started to believe that we are violent people. And they try to say, I'm not the one. The majority may be, but I'm not the one. It's become such a concept such an ideology that's becoming so ingrained in people that it's even become ingrained in many Muslims. They start using the same lingo. Now, let's 
let's look at some statistics here. The reason why we get beaten with this stick and people make us believe this is the case is because we don't know statistics. So, if we take how many, let, let, just give me an idea of how many Muslims exist in the world today. Okay. All right, the range is between 1.5 to 1.8 billion. That's the range. So let's take the lowest range, 1.5 billion, to make it easy. 1.5, not even 1.8, 1.5. How many Muslims have been incriminated on any kind of terrorism charge throughout the world in the last, you know, 10, 15 years or whatever? Do you know what the percentage is? And when we say terrorism, I say take the broadest definition of terrorism. Not, not the most restrictive form, but take the broadest form. Anything that, is, you know, that anybody labels terrorism, consider that. Out of 1.5 billion Muslims, how many Muslims throughout the world have been incriminating any kind of terrorism charges? Do you know what that percentage is? Okay, mashallah, there some, seems to be some enlightened people here who are taking some either really good wild guesses, right? Or they know their statistics. Right? But basically what it is, is that maybe you're exaggerating a bit more, but it's, point, it's point zero zero six percent point zero zero six percent not even one percent. So then, why do we, are we led to believe that Muslims are the violent people? Why is it that when a Muslim does something, or tries to do something, or is caught with something incriminating, it becomes big news? But when others do it, it's just a small idea, a small uh, write-up, a small article, a small mention. This is what it is because we are being led to believe the same thing. And this is very, th this is very bad for our deen because this takes people away from wanting to be Muslim. Because then they start thinking Islam is violent, not just some Muslims. Yes, some Muslims are violent. They spoil it for the rest of us. They think they're doing some great mission by going and uh, killing a few innocent people here and there. And then for the rest of us, we get checked at airports. We get, uh, you know, we, we get bullied. We, we get discriminated against. The 1.5, 1.8 billion Muslims then take the brunt of that force. And these people think that they've got some kind of shaharat and they've gone. That's the problem here. Now, let's take another quick example before I move on to another topic. They keep saying that Muslims don't speak out against terrorism nobody says you know nobody talks about terrorism nobody says we we're against terrorism they keep telling us that subhanallah there's a, a non-muslim professor uh, charles kurzman if you go on his website search for charles kurzman uh, if i'm saying that name right k-u-r-z-m-a-n he's got the whole list of people who've who've voiced their you know who voiced something against terrorism including everything from Sheikh Yusuf al-Qaradawi uh, to the muftis of Egypt to the muftis of, uh, of Saudi Arabia, right? And to Darlum Deoban in India. He's got everybody's name listed down there. A huge list of people. Now, if we're not aware of that and we're challenged by this, hey, how come you guys don't speak? You just think about your local imam in the masjid. But you should look at the big voices and all of these things are there. Okay, the main example, Muslims... They, they're going to say that Muslims justify the killing of innocent people. Now, let's take, they uh, obviously mention Al-Qaeda and Bin Laden, etc. Maybe that's a bit of an old story right now because uh, they, they came into Afghanistan and uh, messed with the Taliban. Taliban then became Al-Qaeda, or the, 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 the Al-Qaeda were created. Then there was uh, uh, the, the, the whole thing against Al-Qaeda. Then they created the Islamic so-called state. Mashallah, and I get a smile at the end of it as well. Okay, that means... By the way, I'm Indian, and in places like this, uh, you get a lot of things that are allowed for Indians that are generally not allowed for Moroccans or Turkish people. So, I guess, I think I can take a few more minutes. <laughs> you just wasted another minute of my... <laughs> anyway... Um, so let's just take, they, they generally quote Bin Laden's uh, justification or argument for killing innocent people in, in America, New York. What is, the, what is the argument? The argument is that because they voted for their government, they are also implicit in that regard. Now, again, that sounds like an Islamic argument. Anybody who votes, it's a democratic argument, really, at the end of the day. It's not an Islamic argument. However, you can argue about that all you want. Somebody's done it already. Now, how would you argue this case? For example, if you keep abreast with these things, 
there is a very famous law professor at Harvard, right? one of the top universities of America, uh, whose name is Alan Dershowitz. He is very, a great proponent of Israel and so on and so forth. When Israel bombed Gaza, uh, you know, two years ago, three years ago, whenever it was recently, his idea, his argument for the justification of killing innocent people, in which more innocent people were killed there than others, he said it's justified. Why? Because they voted for Hamas. They support Hamas. That's why. Isn't that the same argument that Bin Laden so-called used for killing innocent people in, in America? If that's bad, isn't this bad? But no, this is a celebrated scholar who's saying it. We have so many of these cases. We have so many of these inequalities in a sense. But unfortunately, liberalism is supposed to be a doctrine of tolerance. That's how it started. Because of the religious repression in Europe, uh, liberalism became the new ideology, right? After a lot of hard work and a lot of, a lot of oppression, no doubt, that there was a lot of oppression in, in Europe through the church. It's supposed to be a doctrine of tolerance, but however, today, unfortunately, liberalism has, how much is it willing to tolerate anything but itself? For example, it's becoming very coercive. It's becoming militant in some ways. You must have such and such a curriculum. This is what we're dealing with in England, right? You must have such and such a curriculum. You must have this and that view about alternative sexualities, about gender, etc., etc. Increasing number of boxes Muslims having to tick, tick wherever they go. And the whole idea and premise of liberalism was to open up people's horizons. But that's unfortunately not happening. We have to help this. We have to be proponents of this idea in that sense. Help people think about others. Because it's a reality that we're going to live with a lot of Muslims or strange people around us. Now, there's another very interesting, you know, Europe's xenophobia against immigrants and different traditions. One of the arguments of where that comes from is because of liberalism and modernity and post-modernity, where anything goes, the old traditions of even Europe, Victorian England, Edwardian England, I don't know the, equi uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the equivalent in, uh, in Dutch, so you know, forgive me for that. But all of those traditions of those times have gone. It's all about a bottomless, endless possibilities. That's what liberalism is about. You can think and do whatever you want. It's a very fluid kind of system with no boundaries or ends. That's how you can make money out of thin air today, you know, because of the banking sector, the stock exchange, and so on and so forth. However, a lot of these people, they, uh, they, uh, they sense uh, 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 a feeling of loss of their tradition of good old maybe Dutch traditions or whatever it was that, uh, that, that, that have been replaced. And you know, the only people that they see who are different is that Muslim, that Turkish guy with that donor, uh, you know. I mean, subhanAllah, you travel around Rotterdam, all you see is kebab, kebab. <laughs> and you see is, uh, sh shawarma, and you see, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I don't see, I didn't see, but to be honest, I didn't see so much biryani, right? I just saw kebab and uh, shawarma and donor and this, that and the other, alhamdulillah. But where's the, where's the uh, you know, I, I still haven't had any Dutch food. You know, subhanAllah. So it, it's a really strange pl uh, area that we're living in. So now to, to finish off, I'm going to have to uh, really um, uh, move on and, and finish this off. We have to really, really wisen up to these issues. Because uh, this concept we're dealing with has no usul. Because it has no usul and no fundamentals, anything goes, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever goes. That's why, to be honest, Muslims have a hard time dealing with this because Muslims believe in certain fundamentals. We believe in certain things which are black and white. In, in, you know, there's a lot of gray matter as well, but there's a lot of black and whites. And subhanAllah, many of the things which are considered to be orthodox positions that are accepted in our liberal societies today, in another 50 to 100 years, those may become outrageous. That's the way things are moving with everything that we see around us, you know, technology, ideology, everything. It's a very hard task for Muslims to deal with these things and to maintain their faith. That's why in the two minutes that I've got to finish off, I just want to mention one final, inshallah, positive note, because we need a heart that will be able to stay with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we may lose everything of this world, and I don't say it's that bad, inshallah, right? We've still got a lot of things. And I'm very hopeful. 
But we must have a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that regard, I just want to leave you with five very, 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 very simple things that if you do on a daily basis, then inshallah you will remain strong inside. Your hope and your trust in Allah will remain. And inshallah you will feel at least not depressed. And you will feel very hopeful. First and foremost, a hundred istighfar in the morning and evening. I know this is going from an academic talk into like some aspect of spirituality. But this is because we are spiritual beings. Right? We have a connection with Allah. 100 istighfar in the morning and evening. The benefit of this is that if whatever we've done wrong in the daytime will be forgiven if we do the 100 istighfar in the evening. Astaghfirullah Rabbi min kulli dhanbi wa atubu ilayh. Then in the morning we do another 100. So everything from the nighttime that gets forgiven. So now we're forgiven and pure inshaAllah. Then we need some barakah and blessing. So we do number two. 100 salawat on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad wa barik wa sallim. Hundred times morning, hundred times evening. The benefit of that is you get some blessing. You get barakah. And we need barakah and blessing. One, bar one blessing from Allah is sufficient. So we get a hundred, that's wonderful. Number three, Quran. If you can only read half a page a day or one page a day, khalas, no problem. But read at least that much a day, whether it be on your phone or somewhere else. Read at least that much, whether you're in the tram, on transit, wherever you're going. Make that a habit. Number three. Number four. Number four, spend some time with Allah every day. That means just private time with Allah. Unfortunately, our salats, we're very distracted. In our salat, even those of us who are pray, who pray, we Allahu Akbar, and then we go on automatic pilot. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, you have arrived. Right? So we spend five to ten minutes in just thinking about Allah. One very simple way to do that, sit in a quiet place, head down, close your eyes. Imagine that Allah's rahmah and mercy is coming down on your heart because His mercy is everywhere. Imagine you're attracting it to your heart and then you're, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, dealing with all of the darkness of our hearts and then our heart just begins to say Allah, Allah, Allah. And that we're just thinking about Allah with our heart, not with our tongue. Just, you know, really just think about Allah for five to ten minutes. This will be very, very powerful. And number the five, the last one, so uh, 100 istighfar, uh, seeking forgiveness, 100 uh, uh, salawat on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one page of the Quran, uh, number five was this uh, meditation or muraqaba, whatever you want to call it, dhikr of the heart. And number five, at least once a week, go and attend any kind of spiritual gathering that makes you closer to Allah. Not a, not a Isaac MSA gathering or a group gathering or this gathering, but something that takes you close to Allah. And today you have YouTube. Right? Uh, with all the crazy stuff on YouTube, there's some really good stuff on YouTube. You can have any shaykh that you want. He's at your bidding. You can make him faster. You can make him slower. You can stop him. You know, you can change him. Just by, subhanAllah. So whatever, whatever gives you that spiritual boost. You need spiritual. I'm not talking about a fiqh classes are important. Tafsir classes are important. But we need something that, that incorporates within it. If there's a tafsir class that's also spiritual, then take that one. I leave us with this. I leave us with this. Uh, my time is up, but I am really, really, really thankful to our brothers and sisters of this, uh, uh, of the Tawheed group, uh, all the other speakers, and of course, all of you who've taken this time out on a very valuable Sunday. Sundays are very valuable. They, people do all sorts of things on Sunday. For you to come here and do this, may Allah allow all of your other chores and responsibilities to be fulfilled as well with barakah because you've spent some time for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us Allah allow us all to be turned away from here forgiven and inspired and inshallah better people who will who, who, who will who will do something for the ummah who will be accepted with qubuliyah inshallah for the ummah may Allah accept all of us wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen